Do you want to relax? Are you having trouble sleeping or focusing? CBD reduces anxiety, chronic pain, seizures, PTSD, depression. Try our CBD gummies or chocolates. You will be very satisfied. Visit cbdcollections.net 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 Chris Daly here. Always doing interesting things, talking to Jamaican who are making a real impact. And we have a great person to talk with tonight. We'll be talking to Lorna Chen. And as you know, this year, Chinese New Year comes actually early. It's January 22nd, 2023. And this year is the year of the rabbit. It's the year of the rabbit to promote and threaten bonds with loved ones and also respect, expand the connections with friends and families and colleagues. Norma Chin was born in Kingston, Jamaica. She migrated and has honed many skills ranging from video production to mobile app generation. Mobile, Lorna's portfolio includes top media outlets such as CNN, MTV, Fox, NBC, and the list goes on. She has been the winner of two Tele Awards for Best Editing. Lorna is also president and founder of Pro Edit Media, Inc., a company that provides post-production and production support services. Let us lean in and listen to this remarkable woman. To conduct the interview with my partner in crime, Janice. Janice, take it away. Well, thanks, Chris. Lana, well gone. Well gone. Thank you for having me, Janice. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Where you hail from and how you get that type of shape, your view of your life? Well, um, as everybody um, figured I was born in Jamaica. Um, both my parents are Jamaican. My father's side, the Chins, they were there a lot longer. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. much about them. Uh, my father was the youngest um, in the family. He was a baby of the family. So I never got to meet my grandparents on the Chin side. Um, not only do people know this, but uh, from 1931 to 1947, the Jamaican government actually issued a decree limiting Chinese immigration to Jamaica. So, um, it wasn't until after that, that my mother's side of the family was able to come over. You see the increase in Chinese population at the time was alarming because they were taking over the retail market. And so when the restrictions eased up, the uh, Chinese population was able to send for the rest of their family. So my grandfather on my mother's side, um, he actually purchased his bride through a matchmaker in Hong Kong, which was at the time on the British rule. And they didn't speak the same language. so. There wasn't a lot of communicating in the household, um, from what I gather. And so, you know, when I grew up, my parents, there wasn't a lot of Chinese culture uh, in the home. So it was just a regular Jamaican upbringing for me. I, mm. <laughs> that's all I have to say. It's, that's yeah. what makes me what I, I am. Yeah, I understood. And you know, the fact that we're both in the diaspora, the U.S. also had a Chinese expulsion or, or um, yes. San, issue. San, so San Francisco? you can, um, throughout a conversation, we'll, we'll juxtapose Chinese, the, um, the influence of China, Chinese American culture with Jamaican Chinese culture. So, and, and you do see some similarities that we're going to get to later on in this interview. What are some of the most fascinating things you did as a child? Um, I loved sports. I was into tennis. I was into badminton. I pretty much did everything, football, basketball, softball, swimming. Um, I loved watching TV and going to the movies. Back then it was the drive-in. And I was constantly told that that was going to rot my brain and it wasn't going to get me anywhere in life. So I decided earlier on that that was what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> I didn't even know that they had a um, um, 
drive-in theater in Jamaica. Harborview yeah. and New Kingston. You learned something new. Yes. Wow. So given your multifaceted creative instinct, who were the folks who helped you shape and develop your talents? No one. No one in, no Jama one. No one in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, it was a struggle. Um, nobody understood my goals. Uh, in the ninth grade, that's when they queue you up. And Sister Gretti says, okay, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And I remember, you know, this was because you're trying to help you choose your subjects, by the way. And I remember I told her what I wanted to do. And she said, I have never heard that in my life. And I've been here a long time. Pick something else. So I said, okay, uh, give me all the arts, the history, the social studies, the literature, and some business. And yeah. that was that. And that's good. Well, the arts, the fact that you're an editor, um, the artist's side worked out for you, yes. I think. Yes. You know, what did you, yeah. Um, how do you express your Jamaicanness within your, your Asian culture? How do I express my Jamaicanness in my Asian within culture? Within the Asian culture. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of Asianness uh, uh, within my uh, Jamaican culture at all. Uh, like I said, my um, my grandfather and my grandmother didn't speak to each other much. So, um, so the commonality in the house would have been English, probably, since you, they're from two different clans. No, so no. they would communicate. She, she 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 learned his language. So it was like a child's version of it. She didn't, well, she wasn't fluent and it was a little bit of broken English, a little bit of Hakka. And um, mm -hmm. I think, I think um, when that passed down to my parents, it, they didn't get a lot of mm -hmm. it either. So like going to Chinese New Year was probably the only thing we did when it comes time to mooncake and the festival and, you know, that thing where you go and do the traditional, um, you know, pay homage to the ancestors. We never did any of that. Mm, interesting. Okay, so, um, like, well, success in the Asian community has given rise to jealousy expressed in threatening ways. Um, and recently in the U.S. they passed um anti-asian laws right yes and how have these terrible concerns affected you and your family and since we're both diasporans i'm sure you've experienced the um anti-asian issues that that, that have recently no. in no. um in the american culture no actually um i have not um this thing that's happening on the internet kind of took me from left field. Um, I have not experienced any anti-Asian hate in Jamaica. I did not experience any here in the United States. I live in, okay. I live mostly in Miami. I do travel to New York mm -hmm. and there's a lot of Asians there. Maybe it went over my mm -hmm. head. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to like not notice things and just be focused on what it is that I'm doing. So if there was any hate or prejudice it didn't really affect me. I think when I was in New York, I benefited from having a lot of Asians around me and they hired me back, you know, because apparently I look like them. And I think one day there were some Jamaicans around and I might have slipped into a different accent and sat at the table because they were, they were running a boat. They, they, they had had a pot going at the studio and I'm like, oh my God, I smell something. And so it was like the third day in and they figured out that I was Jamaican and you know, then the, the patwa comes out and then the Chinese people were like, oh, so you Chinese, but you know Chinese. And that was like the last time they hired me. Mm. <laughs> but for, um, we have such a um, huge audience. When they say running a boat, in, um, you and I know what that means, yes. but say for our, our non-Jamaican audience, what does running a boat mean? Uh, there's a pot of boiling water and people brought some ingredients and decided to throw it in. Right. I know, I mean, but you know, um, I just want everyone to understand because when, when we talk, we're, we, we try to uh, talk in a way that everybody understands. So they're slipping at a pot well, but I also go back to the English because I know my, um, 
my audience is very large. But so the um, anti-Asian bill was passed in the U.S. And a lot of blacks, American blacks, resented that simply because they're saying you can pass an anti-Asian bill, but the blacks have been here for hundreds of years and there's no anti-hate bill towards the blacks. And that is and that is a, um, a, a source of contention. It's like you just got here. You're protected. We're in, we've been here and um, we get red line, black codes, lynching, systematic racism, created ghettos. And the Asians don't get those things. And a lot of Asians, they don't understand when the blacks point that out. They're like, you people have been here. You're just jealous that we're successful. But the truth of the matter is racism is systematic and it's institutionalized. And a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, a lot of Asians don't get that because they didn't experience the black experience. They don't live in black communities. And um, so they don't understand. They just say, you people are lazy and you deserve what you get. That is, that's where the resentment comes from. And so from an Asian perspective, you've never had that kind of discussion with anyone. Why, why blacks are being treated the way they do? Because there's a stereotype. Asians are the quote-unquote model minority in the U.S. Yes. It's not true, obviously. I'm familiar. But when you want to say success, they automatically put up an Asian person. When you want failure, violence, drugs, anything negative, it's always a black person, particularly a black man. So this is, this is where the contention comes from. And because you're in media, it is so critical that these issues are not being addressed. What's your opinion on that? Um, I don't know a lot about American history because I went to school in Jamaica. I can tell you that this is not really my reality. Uh, when I heard the bill was being drafted, my reaction was, why? Because I hadn't experienced any Asian hate. I started to pay attention to it a little bit afterwards, and I, I think there was something in the news just this week about a couple that was eating at the um, in and out Burger or something, and you know, uh, I think it was a white man that came up and said some derogatory terms, and he ended up in jail for threatening them, but you can threaten a black person and you don't end up in jail. That was kind of odd to me. And yeah, that was... It, that was interesting. Um, I was here for the Black uh, Lives Matter riots, several of them. And I, I do see the profiling because I have a lot of friends who are black. And most of them are actually. And when I'm riding with them, it's like a joke. Honey, remember, we're black. And, you know, but they're also Jamaican. And, and she, my, my best friend is married to a Haitian. So it, it's a running joke whenever I go there that they talk about the racism that they experienced in New York and New Jersey. But um, here, here in Miami, um, where I spend most of my time, I, I don't see a lot of that um, racism because it's a more diverse culture. I don't know if that, if that makes sense. I'm either in Broward or Miami, and Broward is like Jamaica Central. You know, you can't yes. throw a stone and not lick a Jamaican. So we kind of have each other's back. Mm -hmm. The food is around the corner. The supermarket is stocked with your favorite food. I, I haven't experienced that here. So that's not really my reality. Mm-hmm. I understand. Okay, well... In Jamaica, you see something, a very dynamic issue happening in Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. The Jamaican Chinese are leaving, but the other kind of Chinese are coming <laughs> in. And um, you, which, is, which is kind of odd. Mm -hmm. You know, your Chinese, your Jamaican Chinese friends, you know, but we were kids and we just saw each other as equals. But... The new set of Chinese that are coming in, they have no interaction with the, the black Jamaicans, really, except business. Mm -hmm. And then so the contemporary Chinese arrival is different than the former immigrants. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do these two groups interact? The Jamaican Chinese and the China Chinese, I guess. Um, completely different culture. Completely different culture. So I learned through being entertainment 
what cultures don't like each other so I can know which actor to put on screen because the accent might offend people. So um, I was told that you don't put people from Beijing on the same bus from people from Shanghai. You don't put somebody on TV who is Colombian to sell to Venezuela. And, and you know, there were all these rules that I was given when I sat down to work for one specific company uh, when I first started out. So um, I know for a fact that it's a different, different culture um, dealing with the contemporary Chinese. The ones that are coming over now, I think they speak Mandarin. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that were before, we are Hakka's or your Cantonese. Right. There was a Cantonese and a Hakka mix because that's southern China and there, there was a border state. Like I said, my grandfather purchased his bride from Hong Kong. She spoke Cantonese, he spoke Hakka. So um, I'm probably going to put my foot in my mouth and say that my observation is that we don't like each other. And I'm going to say that bluntly because, really? yes, and I'm going to say that bluntly because I remember in the late 80s and 90s, I think it was Seattle who made that, um, that thing, that, that haven, that tax haven for, for foreign investment. And then the Chinese took that. I remember that. Yeah, the Chinese took, has still taken um, that loophole and it's just taking it to a next level. So my father, of course, he had a shop. We had several businesses going on at the same time, but we had a shop, a grocery shop. And I remember my father saying, hey, we're not competing with the people downtown, the Chinese people downtown. How is it that we're buying from the same distributor, but they're getting it at a much, 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 much lower price? And it's the same distributor. So we called the salesman, we talked to the salesman. They said, oh, those Chinese people, they're pooling all their money together. It doesn't matter if they know each other, they stick together, right? So it was them versus the old Chinese. And they were sticking together and they were buying in bulk. They were buying a trailer load. So they were getting it at a much cheaper price. So then we had to go hook up with our you know, colleagues, our Chinese people uh, from, from our generation, Jamaica and Chinese, and go buy our trailer load. But we still couldn't compete with them because now we're dealing with tax. And when you don't pay tax, that's a huge advantage. And we just couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. And so wow. ju judge, judging from that, and you know, like even when me and my mom would go into a store to go buy something because, you know, now we don't have a shop anymore, uh, like how they treat us, they don't see us as one of, as one of them. It's not like, oh, you're Chinese, we're Chinese. They can tell that we're not one of them. We, we don't speak their language. We actually don't look the same. It's, mm -mm. like I said, can't put people from Beijing on a, on a bus with people from Shanghai. It's the same thing. Wow. Like the Jamaican, okay, the Chinese organizations, like Chinese Beloved Society and all those things, don't mix in Jamaica? I'm, I'm curious. You guys don't, you guys don't interact on a personal level? I, I'm not sure. Um, my uncle used to do work with the CBA, the Chinese Beloved Association. And when the new Chinese... Mm -hmm were coming over, we did try to interact and make much of them. But it's around that time that I left Jamaica to go to university. So I, I wasn't around for that much of that interaction. So I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. Out of many, one people is Jamaica's motto. Yes. Right? For the motto remain impactful, we need to work hard and collaborate across our ethnic affinities to enable it to fray, correct? Yes. Speak to the idea of our perspectives and where would you focus on improving relationships? Um, I did a reel that where I talked about, I didn't want to talk about their problems, I wanted to talk about solutions and I wanted to stop blaming other people for our problems. And basically that was based on a 2022 um, article I saw on a Jamaica news outlet and it, it spoke about the human flight brain drain index and Jamaica was ranked number two and that hit me that was an that impact was and immediately I thought to myself if the math is not adding up something is not right how is it that as Jamaicans we are supplying the world with intellectual talent but crime exactly. and poverty and unemployment and you know 
foreigners coming in and just reaping and taking and not reinvesting and the people are suffering and I'm looking no, at the situation don't. and I'm thinking this there is no way out so once I saw that we were number two in the world it automatically snapped that the diaspora was the solution and for the for the diaspora to organize for the diaspora to um, to, to, to be successful, we need the motto. We need that unity. We need out of many yeah. one people. We can't do it without that. So this 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 no, infighting yeah. this infighting. You're Chinese. You're African. We you separate. We have a bigger fish to fry. The Chinese exactly. Communist Party and the Arabs are coming for the country. There's a reason why they're coming. You see, all of we gone America. Yeah. Because you think so this is the land of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And them coming to take what you leave behind. Why? Because it's valuable and you don't see the value in what you have. I know the value in what I have. Yay, because man. because I, I still have my house in Jamaica and I still jump pump lane like I take train. And, uh, you know, half an hour, two hours, I'm in Jamaica and I'm in my house. And then if I have to do something uh, or fly somewhere to do a job, I fly out to Kingston or I fly out to Mobay. It's as simple as that. I'm only in Miami because it's so close to Jamaica and it's a hub. The truth is, and I probably should hook you up with this guy. After I posted that reel, a lot of people came to me and said, we need to do something. We need to organize this diaspora. Let's do something. Let's. And there was this guy, he was very pro Garvey and he talked about Garvey's philosophy and what he wanted to do. And like I said, I should, I should. Uh, make an arrangement so you can do another podcast with him because now I'm I'm teaming up with him to see what we can do. Um, it is absolutely the diaspora that needs to reinvest in Jamaica. And when people think I'm going to reinvest, they think go back home, buy a house and put your money back in the bank. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. Um, but diaspora, Jamaica will have sink in the um, ocean a long time. If we all Because if you see the schools and stuff, uh, I see of diaspora organizations where people can't, uh, the, the earth, earth centers, they can't afford uniform and all that. And it is the diaspora that keeps Jamaica afloat. Mm -hmm, because we send money back home. But there are mm -hmm. other ways that we can invest. Uh, there are bonds. I, I, I think a couple of years ago, we found gold in Clarendon. I remember they told us there was no gold in Jamaica, but they found gold in Clarendon. And I remember at the bank, there was a gold bond that you could invest in if you had a hundred thousand uh, US dollars because yeah. they were raising money to go mine gold. Well, the thing is that, but gold was always there because there's a part in um, dinner St. Catherine called gold mine. People are from there. And originally <laughs> were gold. there was gold there. I think it dig, dug it up. I don't think any is left there, but that is a good idea about the gold thing. And they just found um, oil off the coast of Jamaica. Well, we don't want them to do that. <laughs> they can just leave the oil. <laughs> the Saudis are here. Well, if we find something else besides that, oh, that is too dangerous. Give us all the culture is local. How can we leverage to make this into a enterprise would love to see a Nolly. you know how they have Bollywood, hollywood and nollywood Jamaica, they were talented people giving our giving our all to the world how can we create a jolly a jam war? i don't know what you would call it but um we have to first cut the red tape there's a lot of red tape that comes along with filming in Jamaica. I did try to shoot something there and the process of getting the camera gear into the country was costing more money than the camera gear was worth. And then when I tried to work with Jampro to get the, the, the stuff out of Jamaica, um, there was a lot of inspection and things went missing. The producer and the client got frustrated and the talent, Usain Bolt, jumped on a plane to Miami and he did it without me in Miami. Definitely. So, yeah, so what can we do about that to create? Because if we could create an infrastructure viable, we could have an ecosystem, right? Yes. You have to make it easy for people to, to conduct business. That's the key. 
And it's the same problem that we're having in Miami where we don't have film incentives. And what are film incentives? You look at the back of any TV show right now or movie and you see a peach, that Georgia peach. Georgia is now the South Hollywood in the United States. Everything is shot in Georgia because they have tax breaks for bringing business into the state. So you need to bring business into the country. You need to cut the tax. You need to make it easy and you need to cut the red tape. Simple. That's what you need to do. Without that, you don't have an And everything else will fall into place after that because there's a lot of talent. Um, when I'm in New York, um, I see you know directors of photography, director grip lighting, all these guys, they're speaking with their twang, like I said, and the moment they realize you're, one, you're, you're a Jamaican and lunch break come, the patwa rolls out. We have the talent. We just don't have the infrastructure. And it's all about making it easy to bring uh, projects into Jamaica, permits. Uh, we need a film. The film commission needs to be a real film commission, not Jampro doing 16 million things at the same time. We need a film commission that's in, exactly. that's in charge yeah, of closing just... down the roads and, you know, like making sure people don't get hurt, pedestrians and so forth. There's a whole process to it that I can't even get into. And it's a whole class that we have to do. Uh, to, to, to it, it, in terms of like producing and production coordinating and location management, all that stuff, it has to be done at a level where we have a film commission that works with an existing infrastructure. And we just don't have that. Uh, but I, I, I can't say yeah. for sure uh, that we don't have everything because I haven't actually worked in Jamaica on a, on a bigger project. Um, but just on the smaller projects that I had with um, Peloton and it was during COVID when we were doing live streaming and stuff, it was held to get the equipment in and out. And you think because I'm Jamaican that they were happy to I, I, I kind of stay in my department. But when it comes to understanding how an algorithm works, when it comes to the philosophy of human nature, I actually have to stay in my lane. I only understand one market, the Jamaican market, right. and that is the diaspora and the locals. And I knew that Jamaican people love to argue. And I know that Jamaicans <laughs> love to use the comments section like they're on a radio or talk show or something. And, you know, they're like, people would just roll up and, hey, man, you know how long me I try to find your handle? They're just there for the, they're like, I'm just here for the comments, you know? So I just give them something to talk about. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I, you huh? know, we were talking so about this, this is, that thing. Where, where, where do you, where, where do you, where, where do you usually post on Facebook or Instagram or where? I do it on my phone because if, if, fee, if I have to pull out a laptop, it feels like work. And when I'm done with work, I don't want to work at all. So if, yeah, yeah. if I can edit it on iMovie on my phone, then I'm happy. And I don't even like working on an iPad either because then again, it feels like work because an iPad's that big. I, I do everything on my phone for the most part. Yeah. Um, very rarely do I pull out the laptop to get anything. And it's only if I'm having an extreme difficulty uh, getting cultural appropriation. So when I start off a reel and I go, oh, dunce people in the comment section. I'm not talking about the people who are answering me on, on YouTube and making other reels. They're misunderstanding the context of what dunce people mean because I don't think they realize how really outrageously stupid these comments are. You know, the idea that somebody uh, that comes from Jamaica is somehow appropriating African culture is absurd. <laughs> it's absolutely yeah, absurd. You know, yeah. and, and the only reason they even think like that is because they think that Jamaica is somehow an African nation under it's African black. rule. And it doesn't yeah. it doesn't occur to you that black, when I say black. Jamaica is not an African nation that I am insulting black people. No, it's not. I'm insulting the dunce people who say <laughs> you're appropriating African culture and you need to stop. You know, so that's what those comments are addressing. And I, 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 there were comments like this woman who came on and she goes, why do the Africans allow the Chinese into Jamaica? And so, of course, you know, my answer is, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, maybe because we're not an African nation, you know, we're not in Africa, you know. And then, of course, right. without that context, I should probably do another reel. Without that context, it's kind of like, what do you mean we're not an African nation? That's what I mean. You know, we're not allowed to do that, lady. We're not allowed to say, you people are not allowed here if you're born here. That's it's not what I'm saying, you know. So um, with the accent thing, I was also getting that because most of my reels are in standard Jamaican English and they're saying, hey, 
stop appropriating your culture vulture that is African culture again <laughs> and I'm thinking hold on a second with the exception of NWC most of my reels are in Jamaican English so I'm speaking English straight out I would say 95% of it is English sometimes it's just break down like we like Janice and I are doing right now and maybe I look at Patrick but 95% of it is English so I'm not appropriating African culture the Jamaican accent meaning Jamaican English it's not an African dialect, it's Absolutely. a Caribbean, it's a Caribbean exactly. dialect. So you have to like, okay, what do you mean by African dialect? African dialect to me, an African dialect is a dialect that's spoken in Africa, in the continent of yeah, Africa, exactly. in one of the countries. So, you know, if you want to argue that the uh, J Jamaican Patwa is an African dialect, that, that's okay, go into the comment section and you know, that can be your point of view. But in my opinion, um, Mm -hmm. Jamaican Creole is not, no, Jamaican Creole is not an African dialect. It has some root in Africa, but the syntax is English. You know, uh, I, there was a, that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that person that I'll drop the link, that I dropped the link on, uh, it's, it's a, a teller, OG Harry, uh, what's her, what's her name? Otele Mate Harry, the linguist at the University of the West Indies, and she wrote, is, I think it's a she, it could be a he, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Harry wrote an article in 2006 and quoted uh, Jamaican Creole is radically different phonetically from Jamaican English. It's a regionally distinctive dialect of English. So even the linguist was saying the accent Jamaican uh, English was different from Jamaican Creole, which is also known as Jamaican Patois, you know? So that one where they're drag they think they're dragging me, the, the, the whole thing is what is what what was i trying to say that's what i was saying it's different it's not the same mm -hmm. and yeah. i know they're up in arms about whether or not jamaican creole is an african dialect well you know that's a different story that's not what i was addressing but the same article written by harry um entitled jamaican creole um said jamaican creole is one of the major atlantic english lexified creoles spoken in the caribbean again not africa the caribbean so in other words, Jamaican right. Creole is an English lexified Creole language, which means that many aspects of this language, this vocabulary, the syntax, the phonology are from its lexifier, English people, English. Yeah. So I'm not saying Pato is an English dialect. That's, I would never do that. Um, and it's not an African dialect either. It's a Caribbean dialect. And I'm just reading what the, what the, what the linguist wrote and giving you my opinion on that. So if people want to say it's rooted in African dialect, go right ahead. Put it in the comment section. That's where that's where the virality goes. That, that's what you're asking me about the, about the social media aspect of it. I know what was going to trigger them. I do. And I want them in the comment you section. Know, Every time they go in there to type, I like, the you, I like your spirit. You, you, have to. you have to start doing lives, Janice. You have to live stream. Live stream. So like even when you have the podcast, you can push that live. You know? And, 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 and when you get them, and, and, and they click on the back. We this platform, actually. Yeah. Somebody who, like, reports on me or does a commentary, why do you think those people are reporting and doing commentaries on me? You think they're hating on me? No, they're doing it for the likes because they're monetized. They're, they're smart. That's why I'm not upset. <laughs> I am blessed, okay? And I am happy to sp it's spread. Attention. I am happy to spread the wealth and get other people uh, paid from from this, because look what's happening. It's a beautiful thing. People who had all that repressed anger, I know, out in the world and talking and women are pull out paper and a read pod camera. Oh, oh my God. So they're reading, oh. they're talking, and it's a beautiful thing because it's therapy, because there's, there's all that repressed anger and it's coming out, it's beautiful. And, and, and so now we have a conversation going, how is that a bad thing? We're, people are talking. How is that a bad thing? You, you like yeah. it's a democracy. <laughs> I like that. I you don't see the value in what you have. I know the value in what I have. Amen. Because, because I, I still have my house in Jamaica and I still jump pump lane like I take train. And, uh, you know, half an hour, two hours, I'm in Jamaica and I'm in my house. And then if I have to do something uh, or fly somewhere to do a job, I fly out to Kingston or I fly out to Mobile. I, the, we definitely have um, a lot of ways to go, but we do appreciate you spending some time with us. Lorna, to learn more about Jamaican Diaspora, visit jamaicandiaspora.com. To learn about Chris Daly, visit chrisdaily360. Lorna Chin can be reached 
on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook using the handle Take Two Editor. Thanks for spending some time with us, Lorna. Bye now. Thank you very much. Thank you.